Hi folks, today we'll be talking about the physics of contact and it's the subject of robotic systems chapter 12.3.1. So uh, in manipulation, we're really tasked with trying to put contact to work. We want to achieve some sort of actions. Uh, we need to reason about how things touch each other. We need to reason about how our hands touch things. We need to reason about how those things touch other things. And so it's really important for us to understand what contact actually means and how the physics of contact leads us to generate interesting AI algorithms. Uh, first, let's talk about some different types of grippers. Uh, so in this course, we'll be using a parallel jaw gripper. Uh, these are extremely dur durable and reliable, and uh, they can accomplish quite a bit of, of tasks, and they just clamp down on things uh, very, uh, very straightforwardly. Um, these are not as dexterous, though, as anthropomorphic hands. So those of you who uh, are interested in kind of human-like robots will want to look at, you know, four or five-fingered uh, robotic hands. Uh, these are very high cost. Uh, they do have very high dexterity and can uh, accomplish many of the tasks that human hands can do. Um, they can't, they're not as strong as uh, parallel jaw grippers, uh, but we can still uh, do interesting things with them by leveraging human data and uh, learning from, from humans as well. Uh, people have studied humans uh, in terms of their grasping abilities for a long time uh, because we have uh, fantastic dexterity compared to animals and also uh, compared to robots. And the reason why we care about human grasping is because we assume that, uh, well, first of all, they, they are better than robots. Uh, you know, we can do so many more things with my hands than robots can. And secondly, we could also, if we were to build robot hands that mimic the human hand, we can imitate their manipulation skills, human manipulation skills, in order to achieve high quality behavior. And so some example of human grasps that uh, are, are performed, uh, basically there's a taxonomy of different types of grasps uh, split into major power grasps in which you wrap your hand around something, something and then precision grasps in which you grab something uh, more delicately so that you can do various types of manipulations with it. Uh, on sort of the opposite end of dexterity, we have vacuum grippers. Uh, these are actually used a lot in industry because they're really, really easy to use. They have pretty good payloads and they're not that expensive. So um, they um, can grab a ton of things just by moving to them, turning on your vacuum and then pulling up. But the problem is that sometimes they're material dependent and so you can't pick up porous things, but otherwise they work fantastically. And uh, we, we've uh, used them in our Amazon Robotics Challenge uh, and uh, they work super well. And it's a lot easier to do planning for these kinds of vacuum grippers. Uh, recently, people have been looking into soft grippers, which are basically these uh, empty uh, chambers of, of rubber that are filled with air. And by changing the pressure of air, you can get them get these fingers to uh, wrap around things and, and grab them. They're extremely adaptable, and they're also soft, and so they can't uh, they, they don't damage things. Uh, but they are hard to model, and they have relatively poor precision. So you have to trade off. Uh, the kind of adaptivity and the delicateness of your touch with the lack of precision that you might have. And there are also many different types of exotic grippers that are developed for specific types of objects. Uh, so for example, microspine grippers can grab very strongly onto rough rock surfaces. And these granular jamming grippers, uh, they basically consist of coffee grounds inside of a, a, a balloon. And when you touch the balloon to an object and suck the air out, all the coffee grounds stick together uh, rigidly. And for many objects, you can uh, actually get fairly uh, high friction uh, grasps around these with uh, very high adaptivity. Uh, however, they are object shape dependent and also material dependent. And so in some cases, they just don't work at all. Uh, so in any case, contact is an extremely complex phenomenon. It's not just uh, macroscopic things touching each other. There's a lot of microscopic interactions between two objects that are touching. And if you really got, want to get down to it, uh, you know, thinking about things like gecko feet, which use van der Waals forces uh, to, to touch each other. Or if you're trying to pick up a piece of paper by touching it, you there's a bit of adhesion about the uh, the uh, moisture on your fingertips that help you pick it up. So there's all these kinds of microscopic things uh, the, going on that if you're interested in understanding how things touch, there's actually complete branches of mechanical engineering that try to study how things touch. Now, for computational purposes, however, we need to have simpler abstractions to be able to make sense of it and to do reasoning about contact. And so we're going to be talking about contact point models uh, throughout this class. Uh, there's going to be two classes of 
point models. One is a frictionless contact model and the other one is a frictional contact model. Uh, both of these are going to be represented by a point and a normal. Uh, the, uh, in the frictionless case, a single force is applied directly in the normal direction, and you can't apply, apply any forces on the opposite uh, or orthogonal directions. Uh, it's just a single vector that you can scale with some positive uh, value that will give you the ultimate force vector. Uh, there also is a non-penetration constraint on the object's motion, so you cannot have a point on your object penetrating into that contact point, uh, which is called a unilateral constraint on the motion of that point. Uh, frictional contact is very similar, except that the range of forces that you can apply is a set of possible vectors. So we're going to split up the force applied by this contact into a normal component, one that is that measures the uh, amount uh, that the force projects onto the normal direction of this uh, of this contact, and then a tangential version, which is the uh, component orthogonal to the normal. And the frictional contact model, the Coulomb friction model, says that the norm of the tangential vector is less than or equal to the coefficient of friction mu times the normal force. So if you were to think about the set of forces that can be described in this fashion, then in two dimensions it's a wedge uh, whose uh, angle between the two edges of this wedge, basically it's an infinite wedge, uh, with an angle 2 times the inverse tangent of mu. And if you're to think about this in 3D, it's actually a cone of possibilities. The cone is centered around the normal, and it has an angle, uh, the half angle is going to be tan inverse uh, of, uh, of mu. So with these two models, we can start to reason about how contact forces affect the movement of objects. And to refresh you of, uh, let's say, high school physics, there's uh, Newton's law, F is equal to ma, which tells you that force is related to mass and acceleration. Uh, in other words, the acceleration of a body is proportional to the net force that's acting on this body. Now, for torques, you may not have remembered this much unless you've taken some more mechanics classes or, uh, or college physics classes, but the torque that an object feels in two dimensions is if you take the moment arm, the distance between the axis that you're representing that rotation and the point at which you apply the force, if you apply the force orthogonal to this, uh, this moment arm, then the amount of torque that you have is going to be the moment arm length times the magnitude of that force. Now, if you're going to apply the force in a non-orthogonal direction, you're going to just take the orthogonal projection of that force component and multiply that by the moment arm length. So uh, in three dimensions, we have a similar type of thing, except we're going to be working with the vector dot product. So the torque vector in 3D is going to be a vector that encodes the axis around which the torque is applied, as well as the torque itself. So the uh, way that you come up with this is that you find the vector from the, the origin to the point at which the force is being applied. Uh, that's going to be P minus O here. And you take the cross product with the force vector, and then you find that it gives you that the torque vector here is going to be a perpendicular vector to both of those vectors. And in this case, it's going to be rotating about the axis of rotation here. Uh, the relationship between F is equal to ma and torque is that the angular acceleration of a rigid body is a linear function of its torque. And this H here, this matrix here, is called the inertia tensor. Um, we'll talk about that maybe when we get into simulation, but for now we'll just uh, keep that in the back of our pockets. One other uh, terminology that we're going to be using is that of a wrench, which is basically just a force-torque pair. So we just put together the force and the torque applied by some sort of uh, some sort of external force or maybe the net wrench. Uh, and in two dimensions, this is a three-dimensional vector. And in a three-dimensional world, it's a 60 vector. So let's look at how we can then take these uh, conditions and uh, apply them to parallel jaw grasping. So when two things, when, when an object is grasped by a parallel jaw gripper, there's a bit of deformation that happens uh, to both the gripper pads and as well as the object itself. And so if we were to think about this as a, a spring model, then we can say that the uh, slight compression that this object undergoes and that the fingers undergo are going to cause a force that, uh, that, that resist this, that are uh, uh, determined by the spring constants. So there's going to be a contact force on the left side, 
contact force on the right side, uh, these are going to be equal because the object is going to be grasped, and it's going to be related to the displacements felt at the fingers uh, around the object and also of the finger pads. Uh, if you were to figure out how the overall stiffness of the system is, is going to be related to the displacements, uh, you'll do a harmonic mean of the individual stiffnesses of each of the fingers and the object, um, but in any case we can relate the amount that we close the jaw to the amount that we, uh, of force that we apply to the object. Now, how do we actually lift an object up? Well, it turns out that if we know the coefficient of friction between the uh, gripper pads and the object, we can figure out how much mass we can actually uh, lift. So let's suppose that we have a certain gravitational load. Uh, we have two normal uh, vectors here, and uh, given some friction cones uh, pointing in these in the vertical direction, we can come up with forces that counteract a certain gravitational force. Now, if we have a higher gravitational force, then uh, we can uh, lift the, or we can apply a, a stronger grip force, and then uh, hopefully uh, counteract that that uh, downward load. Now, uh, if we have a compliant surface, either the fingertips or the object itself, it's going to deform slightly, and the effective friction that we get is actually going to be slightly higher than the, the friction that we get just by measuring uh, contact against from one thing to the other. So if we press down hard, we get slightly higher uh, effective friction than if we press down lightly. Um, so we could do something like this. So that takes care of what happens in the plane of gripping, but we also need to take into consideration what happens outside of the plane of gripping. So one really important thing for us to do when we're using parallel jaw grippers is to grasp near the center of mass of the object. If you don't, you end up having these torques that are caused by gravity in the center of mass that will cause an object to, to rotate, like in this video here. So the point is that if you were to have two uh, contacts, those point contacts are actually unable to resist torque about the axis, any torque, any zero torque whatsoever. Um, so as an example, if you look at the pencil, and in order to take my fingernails and, and grasp the, uh, the hard part of this pen, it's going to very instantly rotate. So uh, what I can do, however, is if I have a uh, compliant pad, such as my finger pads, if I just squeeze down on this object like this, I now have a contact surface, and this can actually resist some uh, torsional uh, forces, uh, these torques. Um, so this is known as torsional friction. It resists torques about that other axis. Now, if we don't have sufficient torsional friction, then the center of mass will tend to droop below the contact axis until the torque that's being applied by gravity is, um, is, is below the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the torsional friction. Now, to make this more formal, uh, we can start to look at the conditions for static equilibrium. So what we need is forces at the contacts that counteract the forces being applied by gravity. Uh, now, we not only need the forces to be counteracted, but also the torques of these contacts, contact forces should also be balanced. So the first condition is that for this gravity force mg, uh, I need to have a sum of forces so that the vector uh, mg here is counteracted exactly by the sum of the force vectors here. Uh, so this is known as the, tor the force balance equation. Now the torque balance equation is similar, although here we're trying to look at the torques of the caused by these contact forces about the center of mass. And all of these need to uh, end up summing to zero. Uh, finally, we have the unilateral uh, friction constraint that says that the frictional forces have to point outside of the contacts, meaning they're not adhesive. If we were to look at the original square configuration over here, uh, we'd actually find that this is not in frictional, uh, frictionless equilibrium, because I, although I can counteract the force of gravity with a force like this, it's going to cause that the force is going to cause a torque about the center of mass. And if I wanted to counteract that torque, I'd have to apply a sideways force with one of these other two uh, contact points, which would then cause a breaking of force balance. So I can't solve for all of these conditions simultaneously, meaning that this is not in frictionless equilibrium. 
Now, in the frictional case, I have a very similar set of equations, although uh, the normals don't appear explicitly in the force and torque balance uh, equations, but they do appear in the friction cone constraints. So I'm actually solving for, in this case, two-dimensional vectors, uh, F1 and F2, to solve for these conditions. And in this case, I can actually solve for uh, force balance in force and torque balance with just two point contacts. The same thing goes for this square example. With just two point contacts, I can counteract both the force uh, of gravity as well as the torques caused by these two points uh, against one another. And so this is in equilibrium, uh, assuming that friction is sufficiently large. I can also do, I can look at the conditions not just for, uh, for, for holding objects, um, but, but also I can think about uh, how to stack objects so that they remain stable. So for example, if I have, a, let's say, a legged robot, or if I was trying to place an object onto a table, I can look at what's known as the support polygon. If I were to project the, the vertical component out of all of these contact points and take the convex hull in two dimensions, basically looking straight down, then what the static equilibrium conditions tell me is that the center of mass actually has to lie over this convex hull of those contact points. And if it is in this support polygon, then the object will be stable. If not, then the object will tip over. Now, uh, this works for, uh, for flat ground or flat tables. Uh, it also works for uh, slightly uneven uh, surfaces, but for very uneven surfaces, or if I, like for example, if I have a stack of objects and I want to precariously uh, perch one on top of a, a, another couple of objects, I would actually have to compute a slightly different polygon uh, that it would not correspond to the convex hull of the contacts, uh, but instead is a different type of polygon uh, that you have to compute with, with alternate means, uh, but those are beyond the scope of this course. Now, if reasoning about forces and torques is not your cup of tea, you can also do a lot of reasoning about grasps in, from a purely geometric perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons for this. Uh, so one of them is that it's very difficult to measure normals, friction coefficients, and, uh, and forces uh, directly uh, and exactly. So uh, if you're to just reason about geometry alone, you can oftentimes get away with uh, coming up with, with high quality grasps just by thinking about the geometry of the situation. So one case is called form closure. If you were to completely immobilize the object, using your fingers, there's no way for that object to, to move in either rotation or translation, then you have a very secure grasp that's robust to uh, all sorts of disturbances. Um, so uh, in the case of this triangle or this concave object here, we can place our fingers at these locations and the objects will not be able to move. Now, uh, another a similar approach, but is a little bit less restrictive, is called caging. So we don't necessarily have to make contact with the object, but let's, let's say that I have my finger out like this I, and it's not fully in contact. This object, if it were just uh, able to move in the, in the plane here, it would not be able to leave the vicinity of my fingers uh, without breaking through one of my fingers. And so uh, in this case, it's called the cage. So let's look a little bit more closely at form closure. So the idea is that any movement of the object, whether it's a translation or rotation, will induce increased interpenetration between the object and the contact points. So the two situations here on the left are in form closure and the one on the right is not because the object can move uh, horizontally in either direction to escape the contacts. Force closure is a similar uh, situation, although we have to now consider the uh, force and torque balance here. So the idea is that any disturbance wrench can be nullified by forces that are applied by the contacts. Now, this needs to consider the uh, friction coefficients of the contacts. It also needs to consider a bit about the kinematics and the actuation properties of your, of your gripper. So the situation on the left has a basically a parallel jaw gripper here. And if I were to squeeze really hard on the top and the bottom, then I can resist any kind of force pulling this object out to the side. However, if I don't have that kind of situation, I just have a fixed width here and a basically a pusher here on the left, then if I were to, if I were to pull outwards uh, on the right, then there's a solution that has no force being applied on the top and the bottom and the object just slides out to the right, uh, and so it's not in force closure. If we were to consider the relationship between these two, they're actually equivalent in the case of frictionless grasps, and actually form closure will imply force closure regardless of frictionless or frictional grasps. And But the converse does not hold in the case of frictional contact. Frictional force closure does not necessarily imply 
form closure. Um, another consideration, so these are really nice when you can get them. If you can really, if you can get a force closure grasp, you'll have a very robust grasp. Uh, but in many other cases, you can only hope for an equilibrium grasp. Now, to increase the robustness of equilibrium grasps, you can think about what happens with a disturbance wrench. If you were to think about a hypothetical disturbance wrench, then you know it can't be too large. It can't, for example, hit this thing out of your out of your hand. Uh, but if you think about, for example, a uh, let's say a waiter robot and it's trying to hold something, you, you need to think about how quickly you can tra uh, travel uh, with acceleration or, or braking, uh, and these will cause effective disturbance wrenches to your object being held. And so if we were to think about the addition of the disturbance wrench to the gravity wrench, then I can try to solve for equilibrium uh, forces that will keep this situation stable. Um, we typically don't know exactly what the disturbance wrench would actually be, so instead we also have to think about alternative dis disturbance wrenches uh, and try to find forces that might be able to satisfy equilibrium for these quick cases as well. So uh, it's, we're not going to be able to get into detail about different types of uh, solvers for these types of robust equilibrium problems, but in any case their general strategy is trying to solve for a feasible set of forces for all possible disturbance wrenches. Okay. So uh, in summary, we talked about point contacts, uh, we talked about wrenches and force and torque balance, and we talked about some geometric criteria, uh, form closure as well as force closure uh, to try to come up with robust grasps. Uh, all right, that will be it for this time, and I will see you uh, in the next lecture. Bye-bye.